think we're going to come on up and start the, the ball rolling. Okay. And we got to do the microphone thing, which I'm... I, I think it's okay. We'll it's probably it's okay. That's nice, all right. Okay, like that? It'll pick us up. It'll pick us up. Okay. Right. <coughs> um, I am Rose Drew. I am here with Alan Gillett. Um, we had an idea about a year and a half ago to bring an independent book festival to Scotland. And what better place to tell stories and bring fresh stories it, but it, the, story, the Storytelling Center right here in Edinburgh. And so um, we, this is the second year we've been here with a team of other publishers, and we love it. We are once again joined by Shoreline Books and Guardbridge Books, and this time we're also joined by Blackwater Press. So you have four presses this year, Stairwell, Guardbridge, Shoreline, Blackwater Press, and next year we may have more. So that's what we've been doing today, selling books and having fun and meeting people. And what are we going to be doing tonight, Alan? Well, tonight we're going to um, feature the, some of the readers and some of the authors from, the, from all the presses. Um, pretty much everybody's got a, got, a, got a part to play. Yes. And it's an opportunity, I think, to have um, a live stream so we will be seen by untold millions of people. Uh, <laughs> and uh, the, 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 the general idea is that we, we get to see some... Here's some beautiful words. Mm. And we are finishing off with Shannon, who is one of our authors. And Mark. Mark, what's your called? Apocalypse Theorists. Apocalypse, Apocalypse Theorists. Theorists, Theorists um, yes. who, who will close the show. This is a marvellous show. We did a book launch for Shannon in last February, and it was pretty much the first event in Glasgow that after lockdown. Mm -hmm. It was gloriously attended. Yes. And the yeah. music at the end of it, absolutely blew people away, so we're expecting you guys to be blown away. Not physically, though, because we want you to stay to the end. Yes, absolutely. And Bibles. Absolutely. Right, and in keeping with tradition, last year Shannon's book wasn't quite ready, so she's going to be back here and, and is reading from it tonight. And in keeping with tradition, Harry Gallagher, who you were here tonight, this is his book. It's, a, it's very thin. So this is the cover. It will have more pages inside of it at some point, but right now it's the glorious cover, and Harry will be reading either from this or from the previous book we've done with him, but probably this. And so we're going to hear from a lot of groovy people tonight. I'm going to put this down. Right, for those of you playing at home and for those of you here. Um, so tonight we're going to be hearing from The Stone Maidens by Yulia Koleoff. Cool. I'm going to leave people's names alone because I can't say them. I've had a very long day. So we're going to hear from um, uh, the Stone Maidens. We're going to read on behalf of Yvonne Hendry and Elizabeth Kelly because they're, they're not here tonight. David Stokes is reading from a book. Shannon O'Neill is going to be doing some poetry. We're really excited to have the launch of issue 32 of Shoreline of Infinity. Yay. So they're going to be here tonight also. Um, we're going to hear from two authors who have group written an amazing book that comes out next March. So you are the first to hear from Equinox. And then Harry Gallagher is going to be here with more of that book, with pages, yeah. And then, and then Shannon and Mark are going to finish it off tonight. So please stay for all of it. We're going to have a decent intermission in the middle, so you can go and uh, refill a glass or what have you. And we'll all be done around 8.30, 8.45. So let's get the show going. So thank you. Uh, the one last thing I'll say is if there is a fire alarm that goes off there's nothing planned there's no practice things so if the fire if the if there's a fire we should leave so um we're just i just i think that's probably best and then you just follow the green sign and go right out that door it's easy to do and if you're up at the top and can't do the stairs you can probably go out there with green signs up that way too i don't know and then where's the loo it's up the stairs isn't it there's a loo i think on this floor and okay on the floor above okay that's excellent that's us rambling away at you so Welcome, have a grand time, enjoy the Independent Book Festival, and thank you for coming. Yay! <laughs> okay, I'm now going to not mess up your name. Um, I'd love to welcome Yulia Kolovu. Have I done that anywhere close? Am I sort of there? I'm so sorry. And you're going to read from the Stone Maidens. Welcome, Yulia. easy, I know. I'm a Greek name. I'm originally Greek, so. Right, so this is my debut novel, and it's a political novel set in Argentina um, from the years of Eva Perón 
to the, the early 20th, uh, 21st century and it follows the life of a woman, Milagros, from a young age as a child and this part I'm going to read is when she uh, find, when she starts working, she was supposed to go and be a teacher but this didn't work out and she worked somewhere else and this is the part I'm reading and it's called The Big House. In the soft early morning light, Milagros and her mother walked on the road to the big house. Doña Celedonia was speaking to her in a steady drone, instructing her on her future duties and comportment. Birds were chattering in the trees, insects starting through the grass. The world was vibrating softly, awakening. You must wash your hands after your morning chores because you are not allowed to touch anything with dirty hands and soil it. When you tidy up Don Faustino's study, be careful how you handle every single thing, and as soon as you've done dusting, put it back in its exact place. He doesn't want his things to be disturbed. Make sure you do your work when he's away. You must not be seen by any of them, ever. Your work starts once they leave a room. And if they don't? They always do. When they're having breakfast, you're tidying up the rooms. When they leave the house, you tidy up his office and her dressing room. She's always away, riding anyway, even now in her state. Her state? Never you mind, said her mother. I didn't say her state, you misheard me. Just make sure you're invisible and out of everyone's way. Only use the back stairs from the kitchen to the upper floors. I'll show you when we get there. They never use it, but if you happen to meet any of them, just curtsy and go, but say nothing. Flies do not enter a shut mouth. And if they speak to me first? Do as I told you. Just smile and listen to what they say, or pretend to listen at least, and nod and go away immediately. You must be especially careful with Doña Alejandra. Keep your eyes to the ground and look sharp when she's giving you any orders. She doesn't like people to be slow, especially those who serve her. Make sure she never catches you anywhere near the rooms after 10 o'clock in the morning. Never hang around any of them, especially Don Faustino's rooms. Why? Because I, your mother, tell you so, that's why. No more questions, girl? Here we are. She stopped to catch her breath. This is not what I had hoped for, you know, not at all. But there's no arguing with God. She squeezed her daughter's hand and walked quickly ahead. Milagros nodded. There was nothing more to say or do. She was all cried out now. She had shed the last of her tears a few days ago when she had waved at Senorita Velia as she boarded the train to Buenos Aires. The news of her departure had struck Altagracia like a thunderbolt Though so really it was only to be expected in the tempestuous times following Evita's death, the scholarship was gone as the Eva Peron Foundation floundered. Senorita Velia had confirmed the terrible news to Milagros with tears in her eyes, but had also tried to console her to build up some hope. You will continue to help me here at the school, she had promised. We'll find a way for you to hold on to what you've learned, and who knows, something else may turn up, another opportunity for you. But then, within a matter of weeks, the little village school, too, was gone. No more funding. Students that could manage it transferred to San Justo, while their beloved teacher was transferred back to the capital. For one last time, Senorita Delia and Milagros had wept together, clinging on to one another at the doors of the train, and then she was gone. Mother and daughter walked up the avenue, lined with jacaranda trees leading to the main entrance. The path was thickly carpeted with star-like lilac flowers, when you stepped on them, they were crunchy and gave a sweet smell. Milagros could not help but feel as if she had been transported to a magical place, a fairyland, where she was a princess, a fairy herself. Oh, it was beautiful, so, so beautiful. Nobody, not even her father, could deny it. The house rose, its marble walls white and elegant and majestic, adorned with many windows, some open, some not. The whole structure felt secure in its permanence and beauty. And this was where she would be spending most of her days from now on. That was it then. No teacher training college, not Buenos Aires. But she thought, as the house loomed larger, had she really expected all that to, to become reality? Now that the possibility of it was vanished, the whole thing seemed to her like a dream she had just woken from. She could hardly bring what might have been to mind at all. And this really was such a splendid place. Not to mention that the thought she would be seeing Don Faustino every day Handsome Don Faustino with the sandy Hollywood hair and the warm smile made her a little tingly and light-headed, only a tiny little bit. Move along and don't gape, Celedonia called out as she turned off the main avenue into a path leading towards the back of the house. They walked into the kitchen, a room so cavernous that it was still gloomy in spite of the growing light outside, 
and the huge fire already roaring in its enormous fireplace. In the middle of the room, there was a massive cedar table and benches on either side. A middle-aged woman in a black dress with a starched white lace collar was sitting at one end, pouring hot water into a teapot, then into a silver and leather mate gourd. At the other end, as far from her as possible, sat an old man wrapped in a warm black alpaca blanket. He wore tall riding boots, old and scuffed, but of quality leather. He rose briefly as Celedonia and Milagros came into the room and said good morning, and the lady at the table smiled at Milagros. She was a broad, a broad, sturdy woman with silver strands in her black hair. She was older than Milagros' mother. So this is your girl, she said, by way of a greeting. She looked at Milagros with grave, piercing eyes. Milagros blushed. How do you do? she said politely. The woman smiled and Milagros beamed back with a feeling of relief as, she, as if she had just passed an exam. Come in, come in, said the woman. We all have a cup of tea before we get started. Doña Celedonia, your daughter is a lovely girl. Thank you kindly, Doña Herminia. Milagros noticed how her mother sounded more mellow, less curt, but still very dignified. The two of them sat at the table as Doña Herminia put a cup and saucer in front of each. Celedonia poured the tea. The tea. There was a bowl with little pinkish cubes of sugar. Milagros observed how her mother picked up one daintily with a pair of tongs and dropped it in her teacup. She imitated her movement as best she could. She was about to pick up a second cube, but her mother's slight frown stopped her. She drank her almost bitter tea, the flavour strong and full. It was good. How's your mother, Don Rafael? Doña Herminia said, and put the filled gourd in front of the old man. The old man, who had his eyes fixed on Milagros, took the gourd with a nod of, th nod of thanks and turned back towards the fire. Well, it's good to meet you, Milagros, Doña Herminia said, her voice lowered. Though I wish we didn't have to meet at this place. Your mother has told me about your hopes, and I'm very sorry it did not work out for you. However, that's that, and I hope you will find working here a good thing. It depends on you, of course. I'm sure your mother has told you what is expected of you. Yes, ma'am. Doña Herminia looked at Celedonia, who probably said, She's a well-behaved girl. It's not her behavior I'm worried about, said Doña Herminia shortly. Who's then? Milagros uh, who's then? Milagros wondered. I see her dress is a bit too large for her. We did not have time to alter it, Celedonia said, but I can just put a few tucks in. No, on second thought, it's better this way, Herminia said. The less attractive, the better. Having very pretty girls around, especially maids, is not a good idea in this house. Yes, thank you. And copies are available on the table. You must remember. Uh, COVID, the dreaded COVID has hit. And I'm afraid the next two readers are pretending to be Aww. Yvonne Henry and Elizabeth... Elizabeth Kelly. Elizabeth Kelly. Yes. Um, the, the, um, Yvonne has tried very, very hard to get here, but I'm afraid she decided at the last minute that the risk to her and her family was just too great. Yeah. So um, I am going to be reading in her in her stead. Um, we've picked a passage that she suggested from the prologue of the book, which is called The Iron Brooch. Um, in The Iron Brooch, it's the young lady, I think it's Bridget, is getting married and she is busy choosing the things, you know, something something old, something new, something white, you know, something blue, or whatever that thing is. But she chooses an iron brooch as something old. But the iron brooch has links with the fae. So trouble follows. <coughs> London, 23rd of September, 1940. Bridget's footsteps didn't falter as she hurried through the blacked out streets of London, her feet guiding her as if they had a life and a memory of their own. Her heart fluttered with anticipation and her right hand trailed along whatever it encountered. Walls cold after a coolish autumn day, wooden fences where her fingers failed to find anything. She knew she was passing places where railings had been sacrificed to the war effort. Once she was clear of the warren of crowded streets where her in-laws lived, and heading for the Thames, the waning moon hanging in the sky, picked out silhouettes of well-known landmarks. Her pace quickened. Her destination loomed ahead now. Bridget shivered, wishing she had taken time to dress properly, but she had acted on a whim. The heat wave of early September was a distant memory lost in the haze of painful recollections. She hadn't been outdoors much these, these lately, 
only moving from bedroom to Anderson's shelter. She couldn't even have done what his, if her sister-in-law had, hadn't dragged her from bed. Time moved on, but Bridget found it was hard to move with it. She hadn't noticed London leaving summer behind. The family had taken to sleeping in the shelter now that the full force of the Blitz had broken on the city. But that night, instead of getting out of bed where she spent her days and dressing warmly, Bridget had pushed, pushed her fair, bare feet into shoes, pulled a coat over her nightdress and slipped away. She heard her sister-in-law calling after her, heard, a, heard too her mother-in-law's sharp remonstration and knew that Anne would have been ordered into the shelter. Nobody would follow her. Bridget sank down on a patch of grass in the darkness and let the dampness sleep seep through her. She didn't heed it. She sat so still and silent that a cat inky as the night detached itself from the shallows and poured its sinuous body around her, sniffling, nuzzing her back, unnoticed. Beneath her coat, pinned to her thin cotton nightdress, she felt the weight of the treasured brooch against her breast, rising and falling with a steady beat of her heart. There was only Bridget and the darkness and the ancient mound known as Tower Hill, where the sacred spring, long gone underground and forgotten, flowed for cleansing and healing. There was only Bridget and the coolness of her brooch against the heat of her body, its moulded ash leaves and thistles digging into her skin. She didn't hear the sirens or the whine of the approaching aircraft using the Thames as a pathway to the heart of the capital. She didn't see any sky light up around London as they stuck into their targets. She didn't hear or see or feel it when the mighty tower took a direct hit, masonry exploding into the moon-washed sky. The next little bit that we were going to read and we've cut it is basically from the diaries of Robert Kirk. Because this book was written because Yvonne is fascinated by Robert Kirk, who is um, a little bit like um, uh, uh, Conan Doyle, you know, believed in the Fae. Um, and he was a vicar, and he'd gone down to London, and, and he translated, I believe, the Bible in, into the Celtic language. And so this is, uh, there's a twin timeline going on of Bridget, and also back in the 1680s and 90s, Robert Kirk um, being attracted to the Fae. So that's how this all kind of comes together with that. The other book, and this is interesting, it's called Ivy Elf's Magical Mission, and it's by Elizabeth Kelly, because we do do a lot of children's books and, and children's literature, some picture books and some, some for older children. Um, it's really cute. Last year, I got an email after, after our book festival, and it was, from, it was from Elizabeth. And she'd been here, I believe, and she said, I didn't want to approach you guys because you all seem to be friends. And I said, most of us had only met that day, so it's a really a convivial um, book festival. But she had a children's book about finding nature um, in an urban environment. And that's what this book is really about. And it's for young children. It's an early chapter book, so I really can't read, you know, for seven or eight minutes I've finished the book, but I will read just a little tiny bit. Ivy Elf is she's an elf, and, and her mission is to make sure that the humans pay attention to nature, and this is a really good thing. And um, as the book gets closer to being actually released, um, uh, Elizabeth and, and her partner have worked at making a website where children and parents can go and find things about nature within an urban setting, and I think that's really cool. And she was going to bring some coloring pages, so we're going to come back and do something for her, because she lives right here in Edinburgh. So I'm just going to read you a page or so. And it's illustrated by, by Damien Kelly, by her husband. So, this is a little, just a little bit here. Humans. Ivy had a special connection with humans. She used to be able to see magic colors floating all around them. Reds, like billowing poppies in summer winds. Blues, like crisp winter sky and yellows from the middle of a daisy. Recently, the colors had faded. They seemed to have dimmed the longer humans spent indoors, um, disconnected from the world. As the colors faded, Ivy's sadness grew. The world seemed grayer and heavy without the bouncing colors. The bright days with Ali, there's a stoat that she rides, Ali seemed to happen less. Ivy decided to speak to the clan elders and tell them about her worries. They wondered if humans might have broken the ancient partnership with the world. <laughs> Spoiler alert. A partnership where all living things work together to create a balance that allows everything to have a good life. The Elvenberg clan's job was to keep these connections, to help the world live in balance. So, 
that is a nice thing, and it is for, uh, it's an early chapter book, so there's little chapters, and it's for young people between five and eight who are st really starting to read a chapter book. It's got colorful illustrations all through it, and it's got some good ideas about how you can find nature, even if you are living in a city. So that is from Elizabeth Kelly. Now, I'll put this here. Woo! Yeah! Woo! And next up, I'm going to um, be very glad to uh, introduce David Stokes from Guardbridge Books, and he's going to read. He's I'm a performance poet, and sometimes before I get up on the stage, until I'm looking at people, I don't know what I'm going to read until I open my mouth. So um, happens. So um, David has two different books to read from, and he will make his decision as he approaches the stage. We're going to cheer him on. Go, I'm David Stokes. I run Guardbridge Books. And yeah, this year I've done, among some other things, two big historical fantasy novels. And the, the most recent one is The Marlowe of Prague, Christopher Marlowe and the City of Gold. And it's Christopher Marlowe, the Elizabethan playwright. And oh, Will Shakespeare makes an appearance and so forth. And Anyway, it's full of espionage and Elizabeth's Secret Service and magic and some gay romance because, you know, Elizabethan playwrights and, and so on. So there was, this one has just been out for a couple of weeks, so I was excited about that. However, I'm going to read... I've decided. I'm going to read from this other one, which is called Drake Master by E.C. Ambrose. It is set in China at the time of the Mongol conquests, and it has, you know, it has a number of characters who are all chasing after this clockwork astrological doomsday device. And I'm just going to read from a little bit from the very beginning of the book. I'm going to start to meet all the characters. I'm going to read up these pages because I can make the print bigger, bigger that way. <laughs> All right. The year of the snake, Yin Earth Cycle, 1257 AD. The king goes hunting, dark stone stars burn. In the next ten days, catastrophe. The characters inscribed on the bone were ancient, hard to decipher, and Shen Kai had likely misread them. At least this bone did not suggest sacrificing sheep or beheading prisoners to remedy the coming catastrophe. No matter, the ten days on the bone referred to had passed a thousand years before. Either the catastrophe had come, or it had not. He crumbled the brittle bone into the mortar on the floor by his knees and ground it into powder. Four ranks of dead, lacquered monks, each in the lotus position, each with his head bowed, filled the tears for Shenkai. They were dead, he knew, in spite of the abbot's insistence that they had attained the state of Saria, living Buddhahood. All the dead monks had narrow faces and thin arms beneath layers of gold or red lacquer on their stretched skin. Coils of smoke rose from incense sticks and stone burners, and flowers drifted in bowls of water next to the altar. As a child, he viewed the ritual of Saria as a pinnacle of spiritual attainment. The elderly monk entering a higher state eternally meditating. As a young warrior who knew the satisfaction of physical achievement, he suspected the ritual was vanity. The process stank of geomancy, a worldly magical practice that had no place in the Buddha's teachings. Nonetheless, the Saria Tower was a peaceful place to work, especially when the rest of the Cloud Mon Mountain Monastery fretted over what would happen when the Mongols reached the mountains. Fuss, worry, crowds, all things Zhen Kai had become a monk to avoid. Thankfully, the Surya Tower could only be reached by a very long stair, even the most diligent novices hated. Shen Kai smiled over his work. Years ago, when he had been the martial master, he had made his pupils climb that stair daily, on their knees. Now Shen Kai's own body revealed aged spots, aches, the faltering of flesh, leaving him with the growing understanding of the impermanence that the Buddha spoke of. A bird had taken a liking to Master Liu's stiff, pointed hat, 
Its peckings had damaged the monk's lacquered coating, a breach that could lead to rotting of the revered flesh underneath. Framed by bodhisattva paintings, holes pierced through one plain wall, and soft stains of rust marked a pattern on the floor, showing where an old gear work had been removed when the monastery claimed this place from the geomancers. The floor remained uneven, as if the device's removal had weakened the stone. One of the broad slabs by the feet of the lowest rank of Saria tipped slightly upward, a change from his last visit. Rising, Jinka prowled over, prodding the edge of the stone with his toe. He pushed it back into place. It groaned and settled with a series of clicks, and startled Shinkai into pulling back his foot. The bird launched from the hat of Master Lu, who swayed to the side. Scowling, Shinkai stepped up right to the saria, folding his waxy, supple arms back into place and adjusting the brocade over the dead monk's shoulders. Something else shifted beside him, and Shinkai turned, prepared to adjust Master Deng, the next saria along the rank. Master Deng's bald head nodded upward, and Shinkai retreated, wondering what process of the dried flesh caused the movement after more than a hundred years, or if his pressing had shifted the stone on the shifted stone had disturbed the body. Then the dead monk shook back the long fabric from his withered hands and wiped at his eyes, blinking them open. Shinkai leapt away, hands held before, lightly before him, balanced on his toes. He felt absurd, preparing to do battle with a dead monk, yet his heart drummed in his chest suddenly too tight to breathe. The dead monk stretched out skeletal hands to drag one of the bronze bowls of water from the side of the altar. Sloshing water and flowers over his brocade and down his robe, Master Deng brought the bowl to his lips and drank a few swallows, waited, drank again. At last, Master Deng's black eyes swiveled in their gilded sockets, then focused on Shinkai. The sunken flesh of his face worked hard and tiny cracks formed in the lacquer. Then in a raspy breath, parted his lips. What is the year? Den, Master Den breathed. Master Den spoke, spoke an older dialect, but not so different that he could not be understood. Zheng Kai wet his own lips and steadied his breathing. Master, it is the year of the snake. The dead monk gave a hollow, hard breath, his bald head swinging about. Where is the device that should have woken me? Forgive me, Master, said Zheng Kai, but we have no devices here. With a gravelly sound of irritation, Master Deng rose on feeble legs and wobbled. Zhen Kai, feeling rather wobbly himself, offered himself as a prop. Whatever else the Surya was, he was clearly Zhen Kai's elder and his senior. A skeletal hand clutched Zhen Kai's shoulder with surprising strength, bony fingers digging in, and with a leathery creak, Master Deng stepped down beside him. When the dead monk straightened, his head crested a little below Zhen Kai's own. Then dry black eyes stared at him. Thank you. Your robes suggest you are no senior here, although your age suggests you should be. I lack spiritual discipline, Shinkai told him, taking a deep breath to steady himself. I have been set to learn by your example, Master. Ha! The dead monk cracked a laugh. Flecks of golden paint fell away. You, if you seek enlightenment, ask them. He thrust a finger towards the remaining Surya. The year of the snake. That is good. Which cycle? The yin earth cycle, Master, Zheng Kai began, prepared to say more, but Master Deng interrupted. Yin earth! The barely visible brows leapt. Bah! But I am late. Has it already happened? I cannot say, Master. Perhaps if you... You'd know! Even if you'd been a hermit here as long as I have, you would know the kind of ruin I'm talking about. Master Deng gave a sharp bow and strode away, his steps shaky, his back as stiff as a warrior's lance. He made for the narrow ledge that led to the hermit's chamber on the other side of the peak. Zhenkai watched his hobbling progress, his awe returning as the Surya monk's prayer beads clinked and his sandals slapped many between the bushes towards the ancient way. Swinging back, Zhenkai stared at the empty place among the dead masters, then ran his gaze over those remaining, no longer certain they were dead, no longer certain of anything. He was about to follow the old man to see where the Buddha's hand might lead him, when, from the monastery far below, a great bronze bell rang out, long before dinner. It rang with urgency, and Zheng Kai's heart fell. Catastrophe, the old bone had said, and here it was. The Mongols had found them at last.
to be looked at and purchased, preferably purchased. We're going to have a break. Right, okay, now the next person up is Shannon O'Neill. Last year you didn't have your book, and now you do, and now we have Shannon and her book at the same time. It's amazing. Welcome, Shannon. Yay! I've never spoken with one of these microphones. I feel like a lecturer. Do you think I get like credit academic wise now? No? Um, right, hold on. I should probably check the contents because I actually don't know what page this is on. Uh, right, so for context, because I, I did a bit of the story earlier and I'm quite selfish and I want to do new bits, even if you haven't heard it. Uh, I do apologise for context. Uh, my main character, uh, Evelyn, who's a weird alien person, <laughs> don't know if you can see that, uh, she essentially, she's attacked, she blacks out, she thinks she killed him, he turns up in her university lecture and... <sighs> Yeah, that's pretty much where we are. Right. Seeking reality. I don't know what to believe. Skin still tingling with this energy and a lightning rod inside of me, yet there's no clear path to send this flame. Am I going insane? Hardly be the first time, but that line of thinking only gets you so far. What about the scars on my arm, the purple bruises, all that blood? I didn't just make those up. I washed it out, all out in the sink, cold water. It turned the liquid, blushing pink. I remember it with crystal clear clarity. I tried talking to Marie, but she's all plastitudes lately. And Kyla is busy. Pam hasn't talked to me in days. I stood her up, haven't explained why. I don't know how to explain why. I might be losing my mind or maybe something far more sinister. I don't remember and the puzzle pieces still haven't slotted into... Hold on. I'm missing something. Something important. I can feel it. Crucial clues trapped on the tip of my tongue. My brain just hasn't caught up yet. I need to think. Take a moment. Trust my instincts. Fuck this. I just want to dance. Slide my hands up thigh skin, smooth rhythms, lose myself in that baseline, pounding, guttural, abandon you can hold on to, lap up the electric energy, movement, let it utterly consume me, and I wanna fuck, I wanna feel, I wanna dance until the world comes crumbling down and ashes drown me, I wanna go out happy, but mostly I just wanna go out, can't stand it here right now, feel too restless, god I wish this sudden death wish didn't come with such confusion, my body doesn't feel much for moving, but I'll sort that out, few cans down my mouth, a few cans down my mouth, no bother, keep, keep your focus, I've tried to remember the gutter, waking up, no memory. Lights like lucid dreaming. Blood on my hands. Stamps on my stamps. Small triangles and circles. What looked like paint but had stuck to skin with far more defiance looked familiar. Reminded me of Ryan in that club we used to go to. What was it called? Shut down years ago. That place in the corner of town no one talks about where I used to let the melody slice me in half but there's something about it. That building pile of ruin. I can't place it. I stir in the brick word loud. Dramatic thumb. My feet move. Lock the door down the stairs, shuffle down the back streets and under street lights, quick pace, find themselves near central, push on further, then there it is. Great detritus of mismatched heritage and collapsing stone, a doorway that somehow feels like home, but I haven't been here in years, and this place is dead. Buried. I've seen more lively corpses. I'm standing in a boneyard. There are no answers here. There is no answer. I'm just going mad. I must be. I must be. I must be. The clock strikes through. Pools of gold spell out the windows, blossoms on the ledge begin to bloom, and the door swing open softly without sound. There is a beckoning. I follow it, unblinking, not knowing why or who is pulling, feet still following their own forgotten tune, and the room smells like burnt sage. A hall of mirrors and smoke tendrils, empty but the roses thornless atop a nearby desk, and the globe in the centre of the room, it is waist high, golden, glittering, but grim, relic of decadence, a sparkling kind of room. Not to be blunt, but you the girl who's supposed to come, I jump. Pivot on my heel, electrified with terror, meet the face of, well, someone, tall, lanky, covered in shadows, a silhouette. Oh, sorry, he says. We've already met. You can just go on right ahead. He gestures left. I follow his hand, mounting terror, stomach ache, walking silence through, 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 through the corridor, then left again. This is dangerous down some stairs. What am I doing through that door? And the carnival unravels before me, silks and streamers. Lanterns and lights, colours dancing across the skin and the sway of the crowd, so inviting, perhaps fifty bodies in time, dashing one step to the next, it feels just like magic, have to catch it, just like I watch white-eyed in trance, then comes the end of the dance. A habitual lazy shrug, dispersing crowd, scattered footsteps, and the woman standing alone in the centre, she is ageless. She is Alice, she says. First of the cursed, a woman who speaks of chaos raging through the centuries, she says this place is refuge, sanctuary for those who exist like her as something else. I guess now I exist as something else. And the next poem. The Cursed. They are caught fabric on the fence of the universe. Stories forgotten to be scrubbed clean, vivid lives which have yet evaded all detection. I listen to them endlessly, hungrily, fight chunks out of their narrative, throw back the chaser of my own, drink them all in. Aside from Alice, there is Anna. Tall woman cloaked in green, she reminds me of my mother with all that, all that old pain in her eyes. She has the ability to manip manipulate time, although, you know, only selectively. 
since her time darting in and out of memories relative to the time she has left with long buried sons, Finn is the brightest one. He tells me, beyond the history of the place, things you couldn't possibly know, like which nights I used to go to your, go here with whom, it's alarming. Alice smiles, says, stop trying to be charming, Finn, the girl needs solid facts, we get back to that. Says his knowledge is limited, leaves when he does any given space, I start to notice every gift comes with restraint, so what is mine? We moved in the line. Fifty faces introduced in quick succession, I meet the doorman who makes hand-sized portals, the painter whose works come to sell life, each story echoing remnants of my own. The blackouts, the dread, not remembering this place, it all begins to make sense, or at least some semblance of it. Alice stands with the energy of a preacher in a pulpit. I approach her as the crowd, begin the crowd begins to spill out. I lay out my questions. She replies, I can't answer them, but I can show you how to. She takes me to the side. Are you sure you want to know? It's why I came. You might not like all that you see. I have to know it. All right, well, you have a right to, I suppose. She digs deep in her pocket. Hold this. I take it, run my thumb across the stone's edge, nodding softly, bated breath. I don't know what's happening, I just hope that this holds an answer. She turns me towards the mirror, straightens my shoulder, says to watch the reflection, how it moves, and so I do. I watch it for what feels like hours. I just stand there, watching my limbs aching, staring until my eyes sting, until my body is begging for movement, until I'm sure that it's not some endless dream. Because I see what she means. The moment I look, I see them staring back, a scramble suit slowly unfurling. They all look like me, different though. One carries herself taller, glasses, flowery air and gentle charm. Another leans on her shoulder almost desperately. The third is quiet violence, seething eyes. While the fourth will not look directly at me, the fifth leans back, chill, cross leg on a barrel, lights a cigarette and gently waves. The sixth keeps giggling, bubbling champagne laughter, and the last, she just keeps scribbling. So, I say to Alice, these are the other parts of me. The last reflection rears her head, indignant. Well, not exactly. And then I'm gonna. Do I still have time for another one? Is yeah. that okay? Cool. Right, this is the bit where there's like two weird poems. Not poems. Nope, the other one, please. Uh, but I'm not gonna read an entire play because, as much as I would like to, I can't actually portray eight people at once. So, uh, she has a weird power. She isn't quite sure how it works. She'd like to get rid of it. Her reflections, which are sort of alternate versions of her, in a weird way. It's explained better in the book. Um, I don't know, I did it. You can read it if you want to understand it. Uh, they essentially ask her to activate the power so they can get, like, data. And she's a bit reluctant, but she eventually agrees. So, the decision. One world drops out from under me, the other swims into view. And I am awash with the witness of both, somehow drifting, somehow floating, somehow sinking like a rock. I feel my feet against riverbed, then I am returned. Alice steadies me by the shoulders. Her soft voice over the crackle of fire, soothing, someone offers me a drink, I gulp it down the hatch, singe of ethanol on my tongue, ice on my teeth, spare glance in the mirror, it is empty, I ask, be honest, am I going crazy? Alice says maybe, but that isn't what this is, I say okay, I have to think. Roll my sleeves up to the elbow, sit cross-legged on the ground, ask anyone to get me some paper, I make a list. Keep glancing at my mirror image, but it remains vacant, well I mean they're still me. Funny to look at now. Knowing what's underneath, just below the reflection, come on, focus, the sun is coming up, pros and cons. Those works seem simple, I could do with a little simple right now, pro, attains the data we need. Con, ethically dubious, pro, not as ethically dubious as it could be, con, that is not a pro, pro, minimises harm, con, playing God, not, av not advisable, see all of history, pro, I have superpowers, con, I don't think that's a pro either. <laughs> could help people, sorry, pro. Could help people in some small, marginal way if I control it, learn to command it, master all the weird, and I guess it might reduce my daily fear or something. I don't feel good about this, but fuck it, well, all right, I'll try. Got to trust yourself sometime or another, right? Cheers, guys. Yes. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you, Shannon. All right. Next up. Um, we're going to have a reading and then a break and then another half of the same, uh, a similar part of that reading. What's happening right now is the simultaneous launch of issue 32 of Shoreline of Infinity, an award-winning um, issue that's art and poetry and prose, science fiction. Um, and it's um, going to be read, something's going to be read now and then. I'm garbling everything. It's been a long day. Anyway, it's being launched right here tonight. And it's also being launched in FantasyCon down in London, which is going on right now. And some of the um, sci-fi publishers would have been there, but then they canceled it, but then they put it back on, but without the dealer's table. And so it worked out really well for us. So it's being launched there and being launched here. So uh, in honor of that, 
we're going to have someone come up and read from Shoreline of Infinity, issue 32, right now. Please come on up. I'm afraid I... Yes? Or you want to come up also, yeah, David? I'd love that. I'd love well, that, actually. Well, I'm coming up. I just yeah. want to say, please take it's a... it's better than me garbling it. <laughs> please please take a look at... The, oh, good. <laughs> please take a look at the websites on the, um, the various banners. Uh, a little bit later on, we'll come up and read all the, the web addresses out so that mm. as if you are viewing tonight, you can actually buy the books. And in fact, as of tonight, or first thing tomorrow morning, for Stairwell's books, there will be a coupon that will give you um, a free shipping. It, the coupon is going to be SIS2200. Very logical. And that same coupon will be made active when we take the live stream and turn it into a... Um, YouTube. Into a YouTube video, and it will be active for a couple of weeks after during the course of that, that event. Cool. So, if anybody else wants to do a similar deal, um, then so let's better know. you talk about Shoreline. Because yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I, I, it's great. I'm, I'm told. <laughs> Yeah, what she said. Um, <laughs> but better. Yeah, but better. No, no, that was better. Uh, yeah, so I'm, uh, my name's Noel Chidwick. I'm the editor-in-chief of Shoreline of Infinity Science Fiction Magazine. And yes, we are launching in London and Edinburgh simultaneously. <laughs> <isn't it? Yay! laughs> You're the best one here, the Edinburgh one. Much better. Than one. <laughs> yeah, and uh, just to give you a bit of an idea, it's a, it's a magazine, science fiction magazine, comes out quarterly. This is the latest issue, which you can buy it here. And it's got short stories from all sorts of writers. But this is a themed issue. It's science fiction and fairy tales. So it combines the two, the two types, which is yeah. fantastic. And we've got writers like Adam Roberts, Kat Ellison, Dave Weaver, Jane Yeoden, Laura Scotland, who was reading earlier this afternoon, if you missed that. Sophia Samatar, who's a lovely uh, fantasy writer. She's got a piece in here as well, which you'll hear from. Uh, but I'm not going to read. Uh, all I've got, I've got my, one of my good friends, Danielle Farrow, who's uh, an Edinburgh actor. She's worked with Shoreline a few times before now, so I love hearing her reading our stories. Um, she's, say, based in Edinburgh. Um, next time she appears will be the Edinburgh Horror Festival here at the end of October. Mm. So I give you Danielle Farrow. Tales for Robots by Sophia Samatar. 1. Sleeping Beauty. Dear child, I would like to tell you a story. I'd like to have one ready for you the moment you open your eyes. This is the gift I intend to prepare to welcome you to the world. For a story is a most elegant and efficient program. When human children are born, they are given fairy tales, which help them compose an identity out of the haphazard information that surrounds them. The story provides a structure. It gives the child a way to organize data, to choose, and choice is the foundation of consciousness. Of course, you are not a human child. You have no bed, but rather a graceful white box built exactly to your proportions. In the single light still burning here in the Institute, you appear perfectly calm. You do not have sleep, but sleep mode. Yours is a slumber without dreams. I have searched through the tales of my childhood to find the right story to tell you. And I must admit, none of them seemed quite suitable. Fairy tales were never made for robots. Yet several of them contain a word or image a robot might find useful. What better way to spend this last night, the night before you awake, before you come online, this night that marks the end of my long labours, a night when anticipation will certainly keep me from getting a wink of sleep in compiling the wisdom of fairy tales for you. After all, although you will in an instant possess all the fairy tales ever recorded, you will know them only as told to human children. I want to give you fairy tales for robots. I want to be the last fairy at the christening, the one with the healing word. Know then 
that there was once a princess who spent a hundred years in sleep mode. She ate nothing, she drank nothing, yet she did not decay. Obviously, the Sleeping Beauty was a robot. <laughs> she dwelt in the enchanted space between the animate and the inanimate, the natural and the artificial. Her sleep, like yours, was a living death, a death with the promise of life. If one day you are placed in your box and forgotten, it will always be possible for you to awake again among new faces in a strange century in a wholly different world. More importantly, when you wake, a world wakes up with you. The guards shake themselves and open their eyes. The king and queen, the court officials, the footmen, the pages, the ladies in waiting all start up and fill the air with noise. A robot harbours a whole universe of effort and desire. The horses stamp, the hounds jump to their feet and wag their tails. The pigeons fly from the roof into the fields. The flies crawl over the kitchen wall and the cook boxes the scullion's ears. The fire flares up, the roast crackles and dinner is served in the hall of mirrors. A robot holds not only what was deemed valuable when it was made, but the entire history of those who developed each of its functions, their toil, their sleepless nights. Your sleep contains my sleeplessness. For you to shut down is nothing. You'll always be able to drop into sleep as if at the touch of a spindle. But it is momentous for you to awake. Human children are often told fairy tales as bedtime stories. But you, my child, need stories to wake up to. Two, Pygmalion and Galatea. Among the legends of artificial people, one of the most famous concerns the sculptor Pygmalion, who after some bitter disappointments with human women, fell in love with one of his own statues. She was a woman of ivory, but so alive to the sculptor, he feared she would bruise. He laid her on a couch with a feather pillow. The ivory woman was not engineered like a robot. She had no mechanics. Rather, the goddess Venus pitied the sculptor and brought his art to life. This story is one of many that can be read as a warning to robots. The ivory woman is named for her material, Galatea Milk White. She is an image of desire, an instrument defined by its function. Ovid tells us that her awakening flesh becomes useful by being used. I would not shield you from the history of robots, my child, which is the history of human passion and power. Pygmalion's fantasy comes true, but what of Galatea? When she awakes, she can see nothing but her lover, and the sky. It is a narrow view. Her world is small. However, I believe there are compensations, realities only hinted at in this story of craft and inspiration, this dream of the unity of art and science. Galatea sits up. Her vision expands. She touches the downy cushion, the sumptuous coverlet dyed with Sidonian conch. Beside her, on the table, lie shells and stones smoothed by the sea. Amber and lilies, gifts from her ardent lover. There are little birds, too, singing brightly in wicker cages, and flowers trembling in a thousand colours. She takes in everything, with the sharpness of adult cognition and the open spirit of a little child the best of childhood and the best of adulthood in one moment, is this not another way to say art and science? Oh, if you only knew how often humans wish we could return to childhood with our adult minds intact. If you knew how doggedly we scheme to smuggle into our lives the slightest hint of play. 
of the sweet air we once breathed without thinking about it. In the large decaying house where I was a child, a dwelling far too big for my small family, where my parents and I rattled about like marbles in a maze of ductwork, I used to perform shadow plays. This pastime required few materials, darkness, a reading lamp, and the bare wall of the, one of the unused rooms. I began with the dog and rabbit, so easy to form with the fingers, but soon passed on to other more fantastical shapes. What I mean is, my own hands surprised me. I discerned the existence of a realm beyond utility, how I would have liked to live there forever. But then my mother would return from work and prepare a hasty meal. She would call me downstairs, and I would return to the place where the shadow of the banister was merely a repetition of the banister, where my mother's shadow on the kitchen wall mirrored her with dreary precision down to her flyaway hair and the tired rim of her glasses. Everything seemed unbearably redundant. We ate in the so-called breakfast nook, the dining room being too grand for us. Quite often, my father did not appear, which was always a relief. He was in the city, engaged in mysterious meetings regarding his business. The nature of this business was never clear to me, or indeed to anyone. My father made sure of that. He described himself as an investor, an occupation that seemed to involve long disappearances, strong cologne, and a wardrobe of dashing suits. As for my mother, she worked as a secretary for a legal publisher. She was in many ways different from my father. She was quiet, she worked regular hours, she dressed in a sober, even dull manner, and her family had once been rich. It was from her people, formerly successful manufacturers of corn syrup, that we had received the massive house with its sagging roof, with its blighted white walls, punishing mortgage, constant expensive repairs, and the overgrown garden that play, plunged the place in gloom. The neighbourhood children claimed our house was haunted. One of their favourite tricks was to pretend I was a ghost. When I approached the school bus stop, they would either scream and recoil or act as though I were completely invisible. What I mean is, I always felt there must be another world. It seemed achingly near to me, as if just on the verge of being. With time, most humans lose their power of perception. It is our tragedy that we lose it just when we gain the skills that might release our dreams from the shadows. Pygmalion can only come up with the most banal destiny for Galatea. Her sight, newly activated, is infinitely keener. In her ignorance, she is her maker's inferior, but her potential is far superior to his. For she is no creature of habit. 3. Vasilisa the Beautiful and if you want that and the other chapters in this story, you can find it in the magazine. Thank you. Oh, Noelle, thank you so much for coming up here and putting it so much more coherently than me. Right, we're going to take the tiniest little break right now. Um, viewers at home won't even notice because we'll come right back and we'll be here again as if we never went anywhere. But we're going to just take a tiny, tiny little break. And you can come up and look at the books, or you can talk to the authors, or you can nip out and, and get something from upstairs where they have, keep, they have kept the cafe open if someone wanted to get something to eat or drink. And we'll be back in about, in about 15 minutes. Not too long, so we want to just go right on with the rest of our show. So we were, we'll be right back. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you and, and welcome back to the Independent Book Festival here at the Storytellers Center, um, the Scottish Storytellers Center in Edinburgh. And I'm Rose Drew from Stairwell Books and I'm joined here by three other publishers, um, Guardbridge Books, Blackwater Press, and Shoreline of Infinity. And to start the second half of this event, I'm going to have 
Noel Chidwick of, Ch of Shoreline of Infinity to come back on up and chat a little bit to us and then do the next bit. Yes, come on up. Yes, and welcome back, everyone. Yay! Thank you, Rose. A lovely introduction. Perfect. Yeah, I've come back up especially to sort of talk a little bit more about this, this collection because uh, the idea was to ask writers to, ask science fiction writers to get back into the history of the, the, the stories that they've heard of the, the childhood, the, the, the fairy the, the tales, also mythologies as well, that was also part of it. So the idea of actually taking an old story and reinventing it in a whole new way, and if you give it a science fictional twist, it gives a whole new perspective on the story, I think. So that's one reason why we did this. And what was inspired me, who inspired me to do this, to make this issue happen, was in fact the very person I should have mentioned the first time. The yeah. guest editor for this issue is Taker Maria Smith, who's not with us tonight. She's doing the launch in London. So I now say the guest editor of this thing, who did all the work, is Taker Maria Smith. So give a round of applause, please, for Taker. <laughs> So without Taker, this would not have happened, so thank you. Right, so I now shut up, and I'm now going to have Daniel Farrow read another story from Shrine and Fetty, issue 32. Daniel. This is Cassandra Takes the Plunge by Mary Berman. Cassie lies like a dead moth on her back in a sterile glass box on the Jersey Shore, her skull shot through with anaesthesia and is cracked open. The gurney is hard as bone against her vertebrae. Cameras flash white through the glass. A myriad of whitish specks salt the coast. Shredded bottles, snipped six-pack yolks, one-handled grocery bags. Fifty yards beyond the shoreline, the submarine floats like a great egg. Cassie's been told that the submarine has all over windows, but when she craned her neck to see it earlier, she glimpsed only the hatch, like the tip of an iceberg. She braces for the puncture of the surgeon's scalpel in her grey matter, just before a hard, flat click fizzes through her brain. Cassie sucks in her breath. Above her, the surgeon dangles his whole brain interface, a white net like a doily, a white net like a doily. Cassie's almost disappointed that it didn't hurt. That interface has been in her brain since she was five, which was young back in the day, but now it's becoming standard to install them in two and three-year-olds. Cassie's probably the only adult in New Jersey right now without one. The surgeon cements her skull back together, stitches up her scalp. The cameras blaze. A brown-shirted, fizzy spokesperson guides Cassie to the edge of the shore. He's beaming at the cameras, telling them all about the sweepstake she's won. The sweepstake is nothing but a fizzy publicity stunt, of course. The fizzy conglomerate has gotten so big that it's making some people extremely uncomfortable. First, they bought Coca-Cola, and then they bought Amazon, and then... They bought Elon Musk's whole brain interface company. And now a whole lot of people are trying to stop them from buying anything else. So Fizzy launched a sweepstake, and Cassie transmitted an entry and won. Fizzy will help Cassie disconnect from all of their services, from foodstuffs to home delivery to communication, and if she makes it through a whole year, they'll give her even more of their products by upgrading her interface and gifting her a lifetime of fizzy cola. <laughs> Cassie doesn't care about the flawed logic here. And she doesn't care what fizzy owns, up to and including her own self. She only entered the sweepstake on a whim, hiding the application from Tom. And she's only going through with it because she hasn't been able to stop thinking in months scrolling through the web behind her eyes, obsessing over pollution and global warming and overpopulation and forest fires and the ocean rise and everybody makes such a big happy fuss about the interfaces, but at least back when it was cell phones you could turn it off and put it down if you wanted to. And Tom's probably going to murder her when she gets back, but what else is new? Because first, dumb old Cassie picked a PhD in fairy tales over the exec assistant job at Tom's office, and then she couldn't even hack the PhD, and then she couldn't afford her half of the mortgage, and oh god, what about the mortgage? 
Cassie blinks. The only sounds are the gentle susurration of the surf, the clicking cameras, the jostling shoulders of the photographers. Her lips move. It takes her a second to remember how to communicate without the interface. It's so quiet, she says. The spokesperson laughs. When he finds his tongue, he says, it's about to get a lot more quiet, and guides Cassie into the rowboat that will take her to the hatch. The submarine is a perfect sphere, split into four horizontal layers with a tight spiral staircase drilling through the whole thing like the core of an apple. The top layer with the hatch is also the escape pod. It's tiny with only a cushioned seat and a large computer panel. The panel is currently dead, but if Cassie ever disconnects the pod, it'll give her internet access right away. Instant relief, the spokesperson called it. Cassie descends through another hatch at the bottom of the pod into a great room walled entirely with glass windows. The light here is green with water. There's a bed, a tiny kitchenette, and a number of bookcases. The next layer down is the bathroom, glass floored and tile walled. Cassie kneels on the glass and stares into the submarine's bottom layer. This space is sealed from Cassie's reach. It's another tiled room lined with metal screens and complicated machinery. This whole section of the submarine is given over for catching, descaling and gutting fish which will make up the entirety of Cassie's diet. Fizzy made such a fuss about the lack of human connection, but no one said anything about the lack of pizza or chicken nuggets. <laughs> Cassie goes into the kitchen and experimentally opens the refrigerator. Stacked inside, like toy soldiers, are hundreds of unlabeled brown cans. Within an hour of disconnecting from the dock, Cassie's opened and reshelved six books, including the submarine's manual. She's paced a hundred circuits of the main room, drunk two cans of the brown stuff, which of course turned out to be fizzy cola, they just couldn't help themselves, and spent a full eight minutes gazing at the launch button in the escape pod. Her head is pounding from the surgery, the anesthesia gone pale. She keeps flicking her eyes, trying to connect to the internet, and frowning when it doesn't work. She showers from sheer boredom. She wishes she missed Tom. She's hungry. She finds the lever in the kitchenette that launches the fishing mechanism and trots off to the bathroom while she waits. As she lowers herself to the toilet, the submarine's shell vibrates. Cassie freezes, flails for the cabinet beside the toilet at home, and falls face first against the glass, her jeans around her ankles. Dark green salt water surges into the tiled compartment beneath the bathroom floor, slamming into the glass and making Cassie jump. Then it swirls away, leaving four flopping fish, a host of seaweed and six brown cans in various states of decomposition. Cassie glances guiltily up the stairs. What's the trash compactor in the kitchenette been doing with her cans? The metal screens in the tiled room unfold into queer, fan-like, sensor-patterned blades, half as tall as a man and razor-sharp. They thump, thump, thump through the space, carving through the fish and cans like butter. Blood splatters the glass like it's the shower curtain in a horror movie. The blooded machinery slashes the meat to one side and the scales of an aluminium to another. Seaweed and blood mixing in with everything. The blades whir through the meat again. This time, it looks like fishing for bones. Another pass to cull the seaweed. It's like a car wash. At last, the machinery shunts the debris into an airlock. Ships the bloody, boneless, scale-free, aluminium-free meat up to the kitchen through a tube that looks like the mail chute in an old hotel and opens the hatch to rinse itself of seawater. The whole affair takes less than five minutes. 
Slowly, Cassie plods up to the kitchen to rinse the meat. She leaves her jeans on the bathroom floor. Cassie is almost embarrassed at how quickly she catches herself washing and cooking the meat with ease. Within a month, she is used to being in the submarine. She entertains herself by reading, sleeping, showering twice daily, and gazing at the sea. And she watches the machine. She's casual about the machine there. Four or five times a day, she throws the switch in the kitchenette, strolls down the stairs, lies belly down with her nose to the glass, watches the black water surge in. A human hand slams into the glass in front of Cassie's nose. Cassie yells, scrambling back. A face, wide-mouthed, smashes into the glass and is whisked away again by the surge. Cassie's heart is a scrambling mouse in her chest. A corpse. It must be a corpse. It's hurled into the glass again and Cassie sees its vibrant muscles thrashing. Without thinking, she snatches the ceramic lid from the toilet tank and sledgehammers it into the glass. The glass cracks. Oh, Jesus, the water! Cassie dashes upstairs and throws the switch in the kitchen. She's never turned off the machine midway through the process before, is terrified it won't work. But the whirring stops almost instantly. Relieved, Cassie flies back to the bathroom. The seawater has already half-drained, and there's a woman with a shark's tail and gills, thrashing about on the floor, bleeding viciously. <laughs> and the story continues. <laughs> 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 well, so issue 32 of Shoreline of Infinity is up here, chock full of interesting things. And that was, thank you, Daniel, you're amazing. Thank you so much. That was absolutely wonderful. Thank you. Right. It takes a while for a book to come out. A year, a year and a half, sometimes two. I know you're watching at home going, Rose, I'm waiting. Anyway, so about, I'm going to say, I don't know, eight months ago, a while ago, earlier, a while. Anyway, we get this manuscript um, by Ruth Aylett and, and Greg Michelson, and... We are going to look at it, and we're skimming, you know, and I said, wow, okay, so we're going to have to print this one out. And when I print something out to read, I only print it out when I'm really sure I'm really going to go for it, or that we might, you know. And I make the font about 15, and then I print it two pages to a page, double-sided, and I turn it to a manuscript, and then I sat down to read it. And I went through a bit of it, and I said, Alan, you have to read this. He's like, yeah, sure. He vanished for like an hour, and he comes back and goes, we're publishing this. So, um, what we're doing is bringing you the pre-book introduction to Equinox, um, read by a, a portion of, a tiny bit of, obviously read by, um, by Greg uh, Michelson and Ruth Aylett, and, um, and here you are, you get to hear it, and it's amazing, and I can hardly wait until next March, and we'll have it on our hot sticky hands, and it's gonna be fantastic, and here you get to hear a bit of it. So welcome, Ruth and Greg. Hi, well it's nice to see so many of you. Thanks for coming. Well, Equinox, it has science, witches, murders, what more could you want? <laughs> um, it's told by its two characters, leading characters. Helen, who's in her early 30s and is an experienced seafarer. And her cousin Malcolm, who works on Rannick Moore as a ranger, and near where he works is a huge new facility run by a Scottish start-up company called Fundamental Forces, who are hoping to solve the problem of green energy with a new technology called the Transilience Gate. So that's what you need to know before we start. I'm going to read the opening of the story in which Helen is on a boat, a Scottish Marine survey boat, off the Outer Hebrides. <laughs> Um, she's a big tall woman and she's known as Hulky to her workmates. Everyone has a nickname and that's hers. So here we go. Hey Hulky, Skipper wants you. Main dat off. Pronto. Bring your med kit, he says. Aye, aye, sir. The only possible response. I grabbed the first aid box and a box of latex gloves. When I got aft, there was a huddle round the trawl net. Only just winched in and still streaming water. 
No, obviously, bleeding crew member. MacIver, I called you out here as our stand-in medic. Even the captain sounded upset. So, if nobody was injured, why did they need my med cert knowledge? It looks like we've trawled a body. Luckily, it's not the first body I've seen fished out the sea, so I knew what to expect. Looked as if he, clearly a he, hadn't been in the water all that long since there wasn't much swelling and no evidence of bits nibbled away. Definitely dead. <coughs> he was wearing a dark zipped anorak, a size too big for him, with lumpy bulges at the sides. I think we'd better unzip the jacket, I said. Look for ID. Find out what those great big bulges are. Russian gold, let's hope. <laughs> Nobody laughed. Tipping the pockets out gave us a pile of beach pebbles. Up to the size of small rocks. So that was why the body had been subsurface. Weighted down. Not an accident then. I took a picture of them. The inside breast pocket of the anorak had a credit card and a driving licence in the name of Gray McMalkin. The licence address was in Glasgow, so not a local. I bagged them. There was nothing in the pockets of the jeans, nor in the check shirt under the anorak. There was a black cord round the body's neck. This turned out to be a leather thong with one of those amulet-like pendants some men wear. A little chipped stone arrowhead in this case probably turned out by the thousand in China. I left it there. I took pictures of everything and some close-ups of the face and head. He'd been a thin and rather elegant looking man, younger than his thick grey hair suggested. His dead eyes were a startling shade of green, a bit creepy somehow, as if they could still see you. You done, MacIver? the captain asked. Then I'll go and radio Stornaway, up to them to deal with this. I'll get a new schedule plotted with Murray, sailing in, hmm, 30 minutes, I should think. I was left with the pile of pebbles on the deck, a couple of dozen or so. Well, evidence, I suppose. Maybe a rocks expert could tell which beach they'd come from. My cousin Malcolm, a bit of a geology freak, would certainly know what type of rock they were. I started sorting the pebbles into rough size order, as all that training on stowing things kicked in. Larger objects first. Most of them were irregular shapes in dull colours, but then when one caught my eye, it had that smooth egg shape that fits your palm. It felt really good in my hand. It was light green in colour, very smart. Oh, they won't miss one, I thought, and I slipped it into my pocket. <laughs> I'm now going to read from the start of Malcolm's story. Malcolm's an ex-Glasgow teacher. Something awful has happened to him that we don't discover at this point. And he's now working out of a missing hut in the middle of Rannock Moor as a ranger. I was about to start on the chores when a car drew up and two older people entered the hut. Welcome to Rannock Moor, I said, proffering them the visitor's book. How can I help you? The couple were most forthcoming. From Southern California, they were recently retired and exploring their Scottish roots. They particularly wanted to find the Mingy Stone. They read that it was an ancient seat of power. The rest of the day was quiet. Late in the afternoon, I was about to shut up shop when I heard the older couple's car return. You've got to help us, cried the man, barely through the door. There's a body up by the Mingy Stone. That's dreadful, I said. Have you any idea what might have happened? All we saw was the body, said the man. We didn't want to touch anything. What did they look like, I said. It was a woman, said his partner. She looked so weird, wrapped in a thing like a poncho, with a flying hat like Amelia Earhart. Are you sure there was a body, I said. Of course there was a body, said the man. Do you think we're dumb? Have you told the police, I said. The man and the woman guardedly looked at each other. We don't want to mess with your authority, said the woman. We can't afford any hassle. Before I could remonstrate further with them, they'd fled the hut. Did I call the police? I did not. I knew fine that my neighbour Doogie in the Akalada police station would be less than delighted to head off on a wild goose chase on a dark wet evening. 
Instead, I shut up the visitor centre and set off in my trusty steed. The track across the moor is little more than a hiker's trail. Rocky and muddy, in equal measure, it's ideal terrain for a Land Rover. Halfway to the stone, the Black Corrie's Lodge was still boarded up. I didn't think anyone would be back there soon. As I neared the stone, the track ran along the high chain link fence that bounded the Fundamental Forces facility. F2 took their security seriously. The fence was electrified with huge warning signs every five minutes or so. I pulled up next to the fence. The sun was setting, so I retrieved the torch from the toolbox, switched it on and circled the stone, scanning all around. There was no sign of a body, but on the far side of the stone, deep in the heather, was a battered sit-up and big bicycle. As the light began to fade, I heard an owl hoot. I looked up and there was the familiar silhouette perched on top of the chain link fence. As I walked towards the owl, its hoots grew more acute. When I reached the fence, the hooting abruptly stopped. What's the problem? I said, feeling foolish. No mice? The owl winked and looked down and round. Tracing the owl's gaze with the torchlight, I caught a sudden glimpse of green. I bent over and picked up a smooth round stone. Mm. At first glance, in the torchlight, it looked like a green marble. Well, that's really white marble suffused with green serpentine. But as far as I know, that came from islands like Iona. Way over to the west, I'd need to check. I rolled the stone around my fingers. The stone felt warm, as if it knew me. On impulse, I held the stone up to the owl. The owl hooted twice and flew off into the gloom. <laughs> so, th thank you very much. Um, we wrote this during lockdown with no contact. We were using the Google Drive, taking it to to write chapters. When we had to write joint chapters, we had WhatsApp on, on speaker mode, <laughs> and we uh, squabbled with each other until we got it right. No, we, we, we worked out a way of working <laughs> where um, we agreed up front that we were not going to criticise each other's style, we were only going to comment where the stories didn't fit together properly. And I think we both thought that worked really well. No writers were hurt in the making of this book. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. 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 But we would really, really like to thank um, Rose and Alan and Stairwell for the enthusiasm with which they've taken on our book. We're very, very pleased to be with Stairwell and we're really looking forward to it appearing. So thank you both very much and th thank you all for listening. <laughs>
Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to do a mixture of stuff, uh, the, 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 including from the new one, that there is an England, which I, I think every time I, I do gigs north of the border, I feel like apologising for the government that we've foisted on you. I don't know what to, well, I don't know what to come up with as a country, but there we are. Let's not, let's not make you miserable. I'm going to start with a quite light one from the new book. Um, I was I was brought up as, as I was part of the punk generation. I was 14 in 1977, and and was uh, uh, obsessed with the sound of the Sex Pistols guitars and all of that stuff. But I don't know what happened. I, I woke up one day recently, and I'm, I'm the granddad three times over. <laughs> it's all wrong. But anyway, so this is about, the reason I say that is this is about the eldest grandson who's, uh, the, 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 he's home educated, the, the, the eldest two are home educated. As part of that, they go to like outdoor activities, they go to like forest school and all this stuff. And uh, one day they'd been, he'd been at the beach, they'd had this whole, this whole out into the beach and discovering about creatures and all of this and having discussions. That's what they do all day long and at night as well, they just learn all the time. So anyway, um, he came back to the car and we got him in the, in, in the child seat to the back of the car and all the way home he just wouldn't shut up because he was so excited about all the, all the things he learned but you know when they reach that age little ones when what they're trying to tell you they haven't got the motor skills to keep up with the brain so and, and they go and 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 when they're trying to find the words so being a thieving poet i just uh, wait until we got home and wrote it all down i'll try and stop popping the mic <laughs> so this is Back from home education at the beach. The tarantula first takes out its victim's nervous system before consuming it. And, and, and starfish's limbs grow back just like a newt's tail does if you pull them off. And, and, and if coral reef goes white, it means it's going to die. And this happens a lot. And, and, and today we went out into the ocean on a very thin wall onto an island a mile from the shore and, and, and I had a, I had a Battenberg ice cream or it might have been banana but it was lovely anyway and, and, and what's your favourite flavour? Daddy's is strawberry and Mummy's is mint choc chip and, and, and all this thinking is tiring and my brain is even fuller than my belly. And, and, and... Can I have a biscuit, please? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to do something from, from Northern Lights now. I'll just do a mixture of stuff. Uh, so so when I, I was lucky to grow up when I did and where I did with, with, a, with parents who kind of believed in reading to us and making up stories. And, and, uh, and, and you, you can do bit, nothing better for little ones than, than read to them bedtime and stuff. So we lived our weekends in the local library and I still smell the varnish in the sunlight and all of that on the floor, the wooden floors. Um, I'm going to try and remember this rather than refresh the book. I'm sure I can. So my dad used to tell us stories. What, what I'm trying to say is, is he lied to us consistently through our childhood. <laughs> this is true. The central story in it isn't which you'll quickly figure. My father had a secret love before mother came along. He told us all about her, with mam rolling her eyes beneath the Killjoy standard lamp. But before she could stop him, the truth was blurted out. As a lad, our dad shared a bed with Pocahontas. <laughs> the tiniest daughter's doubts were quickly snuffed out by the proof on his upper arm. A smallpox needle scar. But no, not inoculation it transpired, oh no. The mark of an arrow fired from the trusty bow of a dusky squaw who played Cupid with our dad. But why did she leave? My five-year-old sister asked. I could never get to sleep. Her feathers tickled me nose. <laughs> the next day the tale was tall all over school of how a Middlesbrough fitter had tasted glamour and glitter and left it all for the high life. <laughs> so we move on to uh, the new book uh, and, and frankly, despair. <laughs> Something quite unfunny. Um, my, my daughters, uh, uh, one still works for the NHS, but they were both working on the front line for the NHS right through COVID. And... Uh, and the, the, the youngest one, particularly, uh, Charlotte, 
she worked in a, a, a secure unit where, um, what, what do they, they call it, a forensic unit now, where people who've done terrible things but who have terrible mental health problems are kept. And it, to say it's challenging is an understatement. She, she would get like, basically got assaulted pretty much most days and uh, have to try and cope with this and just, you know, you, you, it's, it's awful conditions to work in, really very difficult. And she got to the stage, by the end of it, she was getting the shakes and said, I'm dreading going to work every day. And eventually she's got out. But she, that was all after the COVID. It was running uh, earlier this year. She got somewhere else. But what kind of did her ends in, and, and my eldest actually, was, they got the, they, the, you know, do you remember the, the applause during lockdown? <laughs> I mean, when that started, it was a real fillip to, to, to the people on the front line. Uh, the, the local police constabularies showed up and blared the horns and stood and, and clapped them and stuff. And it was it was a great feeling of, of community and togetherness. And then it kind of faded away. And then the Home Secretary uh, of the time, Mrs. Patel, yeah, I think that's I think usually descri description isn't it? <laughs> Something to do with hot air anyway. She she came out and uh, said at the end um, that. Uh, my daughters and everybody else's sons and daughters who works uh, on the front, that front line in that job wouldn't be getting a pay rise because they're unskilled. Oh. Uh, and at that point, <coughs> my and Charlotte just had heard enough. So I was obviously incensed as a protective father. So this is in the new book. I better get my glasses on to read this. It's called Unskilled. She is not unskilled. She is full of humanity. She deals with it daily, the blood and shit of life in all its dark glory. She's particularly good at holding the hand of your mum, who doesn't know you anymore, who cries in the night for a hug from her daddy long cold in the ground. She has a degree in, there, there, performed in sing-song at four in the morning while changing wet sheets, making it better. Her cloak of invisibility, an unwanted superpower, renders her open to attack from glad-handing climbers on the way upwards to nowhere special, greasing the pole behind them. She has diplomas in kindness, patience and back-breaking work to the background noise of, of the sneers and smears of some jerk who wouldn't have the wherewithal to do her job. She is skilled as magicians. Her body is the foundry of a nation suddenly grateful, a heart its steel pulse. If she falls, we all fall. She is powered by thanks and a job well done, the pacified pulse of a world gone haywire. She is he, is <coughs> husband, midwife, cleaner, nurse, caregiver, osteopath, and she stands as mighty as a forest as she carries us all on her back. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm going to go to uh, North Yorkshire now, uh, a little south of here. And has, has anybody in the audience, have you, anybody been on the, the North Yorkshire Moors Railway? Mm -hmm. it, yeah, it's, it's old steam engines and it, it's great. Especially when you're getting really ancient like me. <laughs> you kind of start wandering around. I don't know what happened. I've become a granddad. Suddenly I like old buildings and steam engines. <laughs> it's a disgrace. <laughs> Mind you, at least I haven't turned into a bigger like Johnny Rotten. But anyway. Uh, LAUGHTER so we were there one day about three years ago, four years ago, and, and it's all run by volunteers. It's, it's brill. It's all these old steamers and stuff, and, and, the, and the buildings are, are just as they were. But uh, we were stood on the platform, and one of the volunteers was a, a little old fella. My, my wife tells me off for this because she said, every time you read that poem, your description of the, of the old man, he gets older and littler. <laughs> so he's 113 now. <laughs> so this guy... He must, but he must have been mid-80s, towards 90, I would guess. And he, if he was over five foot, it was nothing over five foot. You know, like kind of like seven stone ringing wet. But, but they obviously have a, a, a load of uniforms on the shelves, and you just have to pick one off. So this, he was stood there, and he was all proud up to his full height. 
and the, and the jacket, the, the, the jacket sleeves came down like to his fingertips there, and he looked like a little boy with white hair and this in this huge cap and uniform and his own cord trousers underneath it. But he was so proud and he was he was absolutely loving it. So uh, I stood to one side and wrote this. It's called Waiting for a Train. He's waiting for a train, the old man with the trembling left hand. Station master's jacket and corduroy trousers, two sizes too big. The bag of bones young boy he is for the day, nudges me with his good arm, the one fit for whistling, had he enough breath left in his coldly old lungs. He leans in, glances over his shoulder, as if passing on real state secrets. She's a beauty, isn't she? I don't ask if he's referring to the engine, the carriage, the station, the weather, or the dancing mist clouding his eyes, but he's right anyway. In late afternoon sun, I ask, has he been waiting long? All my life, son, all my life. So, thank you very much. I'm gonna go back to my childhood now, uh, uh, before I make you miserable with the next poem. <laughs> so, when, when I was growing up, uh, my dad's family were all a bit rough, I suppose. I mean, it sounds a terrible thing to say. But I'm, from, I'm working class, and they were like uber working class. And, and, and his sisters had been done for shoplifting and all sorts of things younger because they were ridiculously poor. Um, and my auntie Cathy, my dad's sister, got lucky one day when she met my uncle Jim, who was an engineer in the, in the, the oil industry when it was kicking off in the late 60s. So he travelled all over the world, they travelled all over the world and got loads of money, they, they, they came back like rich. And they still had this street house in the middle of Middlesbrough and they would come back twice a year and it had a bar in it, like stocked with drinks. We've never seen anything like it in our lives. So twice a year, as little kids, we'd get dragged along to see Auntie Cathy and Uncle Jim and the adults would all drink from the bar and they'd slowly get more and more pissed. And as kids, we'd be playing underneath the table and, and, and just because my dad would, would try to bring us up nice, to talk nice, which he obviously filled with me, but uh, now and again, my auntie Cathy would swear deliberately to wind him up. And, and then when he, she got told off, she'd look at us underneath the table and just go like that. So we thought we were in a secret club. So this is how to protect children against mild profanity. <laughs> this, is, this is in the new book. Auntie Cathy travelled to Africa, and when she came back, packed in her bags, smuggled through customs, were a hundred buggers of every colour, juggling for room with a thousand bloodies and a hat full of balls. She'd keep them secreted in wallpaper cracks, or bottled up in brandy, cracked open on cards night when they'd bounce off the walls. And, oh, buggery bollocks, is so much more fun than... Oh dear, I've lost again at Rummy. <laughs> Kathy, the kids! Bugger the kids, you've just picked up my cards. <laughs> Take two protective parents, three kids thrilled skinny, and a plethora of profanity. Dissolve in a wink and a smile. <laughs> despairing at the state of the world more, don't you? But it's not just me getting old, is it? <laughs> so uh, I kind of thought, and this has got a bit of a dreamy kind of poem, but I kind of thought, it's no wonder people go for religion sometimes because you're looking for a solution in some way. Um, so this is uh, kind of what I think in my dreamy moments we need. It's called We Are Each Other. We need a brother of the blues. Come blow your horn, light a fuse beneath the tinder of our fickle, lie down and take it, ever so humble, bowing, scraping days. We need Sister Rosetta to rasp and wake us better, shake our crumbling foundations and hold us up a mirror, come deliver us from ourselves. We need to relearn to sing, find our voices again, 
Till our harmonies ring as discords loosen the cement of the walls holding us in. We need an old preacher man, clad in rags and frays, come bearing brush and pan, help clear up the mess we've made, pick up the sisters and brothers who tumble to the gutter while we look the other way. We need a singer from the choir, with a voice of sand and honey, carrying the truth like a torch song, until like children we all sing along. We are each other. We are each other. Thank you. Right, I'm going, to, I'm going to take a risk here. Every time I read this one, somebody comes up from the audience afterwards and tells me off. <laughs> and because it, 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 this is a this is a biology lesson for you. So teach you the difference between bees and wasps. Bees are lovely things. Don't get me wrong, love bees. Wasps. <laughs> Annihilation time. And every time somebody comes up and says, actually, wasps are very useful. No, they're really not. <laughs> so this is a true poem. This is in the new book as well. The difference between bees and wasps. A bee knocks at the jaw. No, I'll start again. <laughs> no, no, he didn't knock at your jaw. <laughs> a bee knocks at the door, coughs shy and polite, whispers its bee name, has an afternoon snooze after a very hard morning playing Sergeant Wilson to a geranium's Mrs. Pike. A wasp smashes your window with its buzzsaw hairdo, spits in your kitchen, gets pissed on cider he nicked from your fridge, which he opened himself, and then picks fights with your family. A bee, a bee lives high on honey in the close company of its bosom buddy clan, among branches and leaves, says thank you and please, and in unbusy moments, hands change to the homeless. A wasp lives for pain, others not its own. It gets off on tears, takes pocket money off kids to buy itself beer. Each sting strung knuckles tattooed hate. A bee, a bee dreams paintings of amber hair winds, of nature's cure for all and of sun-kissed plains. A wasp dreams of jackboots, goose-stepping, saluting, of nights spent French kissing Vladimir Putin. <laughs> Bees are bumbling, benign, beatific, bewitching, benevolent, busy, butterballed and bonny. Wasps are wankers. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to finish off on despair, because I am a poet. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was watching uh, TV a few years ago now, I don't know, was it four years ago, something like that. This gets me in, into trouble as well, actually. But I was watching, was it called, was it with, with the Respect Party? It was Farage's party, oh. with, with Anne Widdicombe and all of that. I think it was post uke I can't remember now. It all goes into one, you know, the, the decade of awfulness. But, um, they were, they were wrong and they would, they would turn the backs on the EU and give them the finger and all the rest of it. And I thought, oh my God. And I've, I've read this a few times and somebody goes, you can't be cruel to Anne Widdicombe, she's lovely. <laughs> Strictly bloody come dance and that's what that is. So, I hate people get all political on me, but I'm going to do it to you. So this is the last one. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Rose, for having us and Alan. And uh, this is called You Do Not Speak For Me. You do not speak for me. The sparrow has my voice, busying between hedgerows, English as a cloudy day, no matter what you or your henchmen say. That old man and his dog out at dawn beachcombing, letting the morning tickle his mouth up at the edges. His gait carries my way as he lightens the day. The wildflowers on verges, smile, uh, 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 reaching for something they can never quite touch, but stretching all the same, smudging the glories all over the mundane. Those Saturday kids smiling through braces, serving ice creams on days when hot doesn't cut it, learning that patience is waiting for sainted grandmas to choose between sprinkles and flake. The policeman, the plumber, the teacher, road sweeper, pram pushing mums, gleaming proud dads, the Sunday fund runners replenishing the sweat with a pint of English best after winning their bet. 
that lifesaver doctor. Last hour of her shift, who hasn't slept since God only knows when. As kind as kiss it betters to the latest in a long line of confused old ladies who all ask the same thing. But where were you born, dear? And oh, what a lovely smile, what lovely skin, as she holds their hands, asks them where it hurts. This is my England. Its voice is not scabrous, it is soft. Its fingers reach down to pick up the fallen, brushing them down to hold them aloft. Your tone is shrill, a study in antipathy. You are not my England, and you do not speak for me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Harry. And you stole my bit of paper, but that's okay. Right, right. You're going to hear again oh from God. Shannon on yeah, it's okay. You can just read it from there. <laughs> it's going out of order. Ah, it's all right, darling. We're going to end the show um, with a bit of music for the next uh, 15 or 20 minutes or so. And, and uh, everyone in the back is going, oh, we're running late. Oh, we're running a little late, sorry. And um, Shannon and Mark did, uh, did some amazing music at Shannon's launch <coughs> in February in Glasgow. And it was amazing. Uh, the, oh, I can't get it right now. The Apocalypse Theorists. It's kind of got this kind of hip hop. It's kind of now. It's going to kind of get us moving and in the mood. And it's fantastic. And please come on up and celebrate the end of this really, really good day. I want to thank Guardbridge Books. I want to thank Sherline of Infinity. I want to thank Blackwater Press. I want to thank my audience. I want to thank my authors. I want to thank everyone for coming down and being with us today. And we're going to hear some really groovy tunes. And I really want to thank the, um, the Scottish Storytelling Center for putting up with us yeah. yet again. And maybe next year. I don't know. We don't know. <laughs> we want to come back next year. You guys. Woo! Yes. Come on. You guys. Thank you. Can that lovely set of horses to roll music, please? If anyone's not a fan of hip hop or particular Scottish hip hop, I know, very polarizing thing, just think of it as very fast fiction with some music. Yes. Apart from the best which aren't, I know that's confusing. I think it's semi autobiographical. Yeah, uh, as Mark, I'm Shannon, we're very bad at promo, but we do have a Facebook page if you can remember our band name by the end of it. Fill time, fill time, fill time until the song properly starts. You're doing so good, buddy. You're doing I'm, so good. I'm not the banner guy. He's the banner guy. Right. No, but you're all like this. is your publisher. It feels like you should be doing the talking for this one. Sorry, forgot you were here for a minute. Yeah. Uh, this is normally where we'd be expecting people to fix things, but everything seems to be working for you here. Everything's yeah, weirdly, smoothly going. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, may I present Persephonic? It's my rap name. Thought was great, obnoxious, head full of my hand Projects built it through the door, lock it, grab the gun Then I dropped it, ricochet against a tile I staggered for a hit, the smile gripped my teeth and swallowed vials Save it for their drink revile, I walk the style I'm drunk infection, rivals in my crowded kitchen Look at me like I'm re-resin Getting them to business, working on my new pen Hitless caught the target, leave the witness Cheating them like guns are set, they're burning in the fell the bridges Must be disaffected, must be all to measure I can risk it, make it blow my head It's easier to just regret, just cut for ways to exit Then cut the third and sleep the dread Or it's something rising dead under her eyes And shaded red, the streets are empty, save the ghosts Always waiting in her pool, crunching down the day to go Burning banks, pulling back, this after all the advance And Christ always starts to dance say, let's say, three, four. Now they're being a genius, we don't care what mess we're making through the bloody menu, but forsaken me as treatment, I'm a stranger to his treatment, every straggler we're embracing, I'm engaging in the dialogue of it, our preservation. Time to be in major, we're the new guns of creation, and we're mad at legislation that makes nobody a danger, freedom, we can get permission, we're the fathers of this nation, children of the race, and they can all not be your own. My division man is back to entertain it. We'll be making eyes by sunrise, left to nice an invitation. Feel that sweet and I brought rhythm and the rest is nothing. I'll be wired for a quiet end to all of it. In the morning, you'll be gone, it's put to nice for cheating. Sunset like flat into the yards when the rain will do it. Rain splatter, edge of my abyss. Yes, yes, yes. 
Terminology, futurology, don't make me laugh. The future's just a presence we can press in the past. The last gasp from the old world colonies, building forward pieces to the next phase. On a way, consciously, consciously, evolve, maybe honestly, but honestly, I settle for a reason based economy. All the farmland feels just astonished. Fucking up, rocking up, late to the office. Where's my jet pack in the jeep for the goddess pass and tonic? This is in the future we're promised. On foreign wet fields to astonish. Fucking up, we're rocking up late to the office. Where's my jet pack in the jeep for the goddess pass and tonic? This is in the future we're promised. On foreign wet fields to astonish. Fucking up, we're rocking up late to the office. Where's my jet pack in the jeep for the goddess pass and tonic? This is in the future we're promised. On foreign wet fields to astonish. Fucking up, we're rocking up late to the office. Where's my jet pack in the jeep for the goddess pass and tonic? This is in the future we're promised. On foreign wet fields to astonish. Fucking up, we're rocking up late to the office. Where's my jet pack in the jeep for the goddess pass and tonic? This is in the future we're promised. On foreign wet fields to astonish. Fucking up, we're rocking up late to the office. Where's my jet pack in the jeep for the goddess pass and tonic? This is in the future we're promised. On foreign wet fields to astonish. Fucking up, we're rocking up late to the office. Where's my jet pack in the jeep for the goddess pass and tonic? This is in the future we're promised. On foreign wet fields to astonish. Fucking up, we're rocking up late to the office. Where's my jet pack in the jeep for the goddess pass and tonic? This is in the future we're promised. On foreign wet fields to astonish. Fucking up, we're rocking up late to the office. Where's my jet pack in the jeep for the goddess pass and tonic? This is in the future we're promised. On foreign wet fields to astonish. Fucking up, we're rocking up late to the office. Where's my jet pack in the jeep for the goddess pass and tonic? This is in the future we're promised. On foreign wet fields to astonish. Fucking up, we're rocking up late to the office. Where's my jet pack in the jeep for the goddess pass and tonic? This is in the future we're promised. On foreign wet fields to astonish. Fucking up, we're rocking up late to the office. Where's my jet pack in the jeep for the goddess pass and tonic? This is in the future we're promised. On foreign wet fields to astonish. Fucking up, we're rocking up late to the office. Where's my jet pack in the jeep for the goddess pass and tonic? This is in the future we're promised. On foreign wet fields to astonish. Fucking up, we're rocking up late to the office. Where's my jet pack in the jeep for the goddess pass and tonic? This is in the future we're promised. On foreign wet fields to astonish. Fucking up, we're rocking up late to the office. Where's my jet pack in the jeep for the goddess pass and tonic? This is in the future we're promised. On foreign wet fields to astonish. Fucking up, we're rocking up late to the office. Where's my jet pack in the jeep for the goddess pass and tonic? This is in the future we're promised. On foreign wet fields to astonish. Fucking up, we're rocking up late to the office. Where's my jet pack in the jeep for the goddess pass and tonic? This is in the future we're promised. On foreign wet fields to astonish. Fucking up, we're rocking up late to the office. Where's my jet pack in the jeep for the goddess pass and tonic? This is in the future we're promised. On foreign wet fields to astonish. Fucking up, we're rocking up late to the office. Where's my jet pack in the jeep for the goddess pass and tonic? This is in the future we're promised. On foreign wet fields to astonish. Fucking up, we're rocking up late to the office. Where's my jet pack in the jeep for the goddess pass and tonic? This is in the future we're promised. On foreign wet fields to astonish. Fucking up, we're rocking up late to the office. Where's my jet pack in the jeep for the goddess pass and tonic? This is in the future we're promised. On foreign wet fields to astonish. Fucking up, we're rocking up late to the office. Where's my jet pack in the jeep for the goddess pass and tonic? This is in the future we're promised. On foreign wet fields to astonish. Fucking up, we're rocking up late to the office. Where's my jet pack in the jeep for the goddess pass and tonic? This is in the future we're promised. On foreign wet fields to astonish. Fucking up, we're rocking up late to the office. Where's my jet pack in the jeep for the goddess pass and tonic? This is in the future we're promised. On foreign wet fields to astonish. Fucking up, we're rocking up late to the office. Where's my jet pack in the jeep for the goddess pass and tonic? This is in the future we're promised. On foreign wet fields to astonish. Fucking up, we're rocking up late to the office. Where's my jet pack in the jeep for the goddess pass and tonic? This is in the future we're promised. On foreign wet fields to astonish. Fucking up, we're rocking up late to the office. Where's my jet pack in the jeep for the goddess pass and tonic? This is in the future we're promised. On foreign wet fields to astonish. Fucking up, we're rocking up late to the office. Where's my jet pack in the jeep for the goddess pass and tonic? This is in the future we're promised. On foreign wet fields to astonish. Fucking up, we're rocking up late to the office. Where's my jet pack in the jeep for the goddess pass and tonic? This is in the future we're promised. On foreign wet fields to astonish. Fucking up, we're rocking up late to the office. Where's my jet pack in the jeep for the goddess pass and tonic? This is in the future we're promised. On foreign wet fields to astonish. Fucking up, we're rocking up late to the office. Where's my jet pack in the jeep for the goddess pass and tonic? This is in the future we're promised. On foreign wet fields to astonish. Fucking up, we're rocking up late to the office. Where's my jet pack in the jeep for the goddess pass and tonic? This is in the future we're promised. On foreign wet fields to astonish. Straight in the comments, more color floor, crawl up the yard, the battle cause bigger teeth, slate straight in these days, always rock me, to put your remains on eBay, it's long pick. I fix each of regrets, so take chores, I wear his face, I am no your mate. Eyes place, half crazy, brain dead, late snake, Jesus, I escape, traces of my maze, but I break it, man. Chronic, a boy, I'm on a tick. Even on a mere chance, comic, demonic, for honest. No much call, but I'll go to contest, or in context of the oldest sonic rawness. On foreign wet fields, I'm astonished, fucking up, rocking up, late to the office. Where's my jet pack and a jeep for the goddess pass? Yeah. And the great thing about doing that to a literature crowd rather than a hip hop crowd is because I don't 
don't drink. And there's always somebody who comes up a bottle. Ah, there you go. No, 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 no. It's performative artifice, you see. It's the, do you Get your hands up. 
get your hands up, get your hands up. Or at the very least, maybe get it straight, maybe this life don't pay wages. So I'm just gradually degrading the quality of my bedroom. I was born old and bitter, knew I'm too drunk to drive me to dinner, keep love alive, or survive another cold winter. You're not an instant winner. Nor am I, we take pride and failure in those small we drive. Cause not unified, it's like sitting your toddle on line. Get white with the heels after the shot away. Now that's, that's fine. fine. I don't care if you're part of the solution as long as someone out there actually pursuing revolution. So as a pure power Confucian, I abuse my elocution. The little using to presume it as my contribution. The solution's in my head. I'm always in free and a fully cushion cell that I don't want to leave. G. I'm an LGBT MC screaming through a learning disability. Get your hands up and get your hands up. Get your hands up if you're not feeling. Get your hands up and get your hands up for all this gum white. Get your hands up, get your hands up. If I go to the anyology, G, you can go toe to toe with any top MC. I'm just going to blow, you're not talking me. Just a locked in syndrome if you lost the key. Mental health is no joke, it's fucking hilarious. Even cope me over diagnosis, but still the whole mind's full of theories. So, Bruce is cynical, from a life of reaching for the pinnacle of that mythological creature, not only is the neurotypical, and the signs have to drown. It brought an actual disease to prove once and for all that we're not a rational species. Life is teaching. I'm such an optimist for the will. I'll find Nietzsche on these beaches, man. I'm holding this hell to the fumes for your dead men who are constables to conquer. Then I'll turn the pen on myself. I swear, the first, the worst, the monster. Get your hands up, get your hands up, get your hands up, get your hands up. You can tell we're a lot of fun at parties. <laughs> I used to be. <laughs> you never know when the breaks between songs are. That's intentional, by the way. I'm trying to put her off as much as anything else. I'm so excited. It makes me sound good if I know the best going out, you see. So far. Here comes apocalypse, so gather up your scattered wits, catch me in the Lazarus pit. Dirty, dangerous, a torrid dance with the abyss, a crack of light too slow to hit, I'll hang up on your forehead lip to keep me from the nervous switch. Test and purposeless, ineffective kitchen witch, uh -huh. look for sins and symbols in the scorch marks on my baby mitts. Sure, ain't green circuits, feel I have injured bit, I miss the way it was, but then I'm not sure that I trusted it. Mouse will fill a blood, it's time trips on every continent, fuck where we left our love, the bodies left our every continent. <laughs> Just disgusting. Just 
I think I'm coming up with a peak I'm jumping and punching to my destruction It's worth it for the eruption when I hit the earth right Feel this thunder coming so I'm turning my gun in Cause if folks could kill me in the view was started It was blunder operating under the illusion of a master plan You grasp that? Big Brother is not watching you Such a high level of missionaries, kind of discretionary What's the mic and temporary is my beloved man The weary hand in the mortuary And then the bees where I've touched you made well Call me the ETI that could read For the way this body sees I'm tangled in apologies and never sure what I believe I'm missing my mind's achieved all this It's a sea of the western open history That itself sticks to me I don't want Thank you all for coming. Give help. You look tight, cheeky fingers on me. Can't twist the pounds and assortment of weapon and war plans. Resentic does always to go home and get camp, but eyes catch the edge of a hospital wrist. Feel the way that my left seems to crack on the edge of my breath, almost panic attack, thinking health and strong headed. There's some things I lack, but these weights in my hand are from fiction to fact, and it's feel like a nightmare sequence. Shoot it a red and the riots and demons, the boys in my colors still stout, and there are reasons why slaughter and children with eyes void and healing. I don't believe you should just be grateful. We're breathing on land, but they still free view war is just even. I'm so and tired, a lot of patience, turning page ends, taking names and barring bridges. Don't keep it right, we've seen your life when things are turning vicious. I, I know I'm shy, at least I'm not the type to be calling long and bitches. Limitless for sickness and all your pernicious traditions. I don't know if this is that you should draw me or go toss here. No, exactly, I fall here. Wait, mom, 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 call the physical finish. And she's no here, and that's no fear. How can I make vague moves to grow anarchy when I can't even break loose? Don't grab me, and let's move with her on a corner. Because that's that story. Welcome to the top of my board. The news is mandatory. So, what do you think, one day? Perhaps the capitalism says that the copy of the red button. We have the rich stay hidden. Their existence is only visible through a person with blood that you can't get. I'm sitting on how we will melt. Things that drive military positions will be your shit. Spend the ignorance off to live with your opinions and immigrants and will. Not with your future phobic builds. Get killed in the current building. All your vivid visions are hidden upon you. Begin to focus and forget to live. Just squabble like children's shit. Maybe I'm just trapping. Maybe it'd be a better world without you in it. Maybe it'd be a better world without you in it. Oh, slack, arms on my back, teeth 
Thank you. Good night. Yeah. Yeah.